Christmas. Tell the person beside you, Merry Christmas. I hope you're having a good Christmas as I'm having. i just like to celebrate it all week long. Amen? But uh, good to see you this morning. I know some of you uh, have friends and family here and welcome you to the service as well. Uh, we're excited about what the Lord's doing around Believers Fellowship. Had a great service out of the campus this morning. A Merry Christmas time. Hope that you're having one as well today as we remember this time of year when probably the greatest two events in history is the birth of the Lord Jesus, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Of course, the crucifixion in there, highlighting the center post of all things. Uh, praise God, our Father, that He sent His Son 2,000 plus years ago to be the Savior of the world. Mary, sweet Mary, tonight your Savior's born. Your King is born. Your Master's born. And that's the truth. You know, we, we talk about Christmas and all the events of Christmas, and sometimes we just miss the reality of, of the, the centerpiece of it all, of Jesus. We say sometimes He's the reason for the season. That is true. But I want to talk about Jesus today. And, you know, some people say, well, what's in a name? You may be surprised at what's in the name of Jesus. And I want to look at it from two perspectives. I want to look from the Old Testament and as well as from the New Testament because... In the Old Testament, we have some figures by this same name, although the biblical spelling in the, in the, is a little different. But the Hebrew, the original, is pretty much relatively the same for these names that we'll talk about. So I want to talk about the name of Jesus. And by the way, it was a common name. The angel said unto her, Mary, Fear not, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you shall conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. What a name that the Lord gives. Now, Mary and Joseph are sitting there, and I don't know about you, when you, you uh, first heard the news that you were expecting a child, uh, first thing that parents begin to go through is that, what are we going to call this child? And, then, and of course, you got mama's ideas and daddy's ideas, and hopefully somehow come to peace in the middle of it all. But the idea here is that uh, Mary nor Joseph were the ones who gave the name Jesus to Jesus. It was his heavenly father, by all rights, that would give him the name. And he called him Jesus. Now, that's the name. Now, we know in other places that Jesus referred to by, there's one place the angel, he shall be called Emmanuel. It's one thing to be called something, to be named something. His name is Jesus. He's called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Some people have asked me before about, well, there, one place the Bible says that he's going to be Emmanuel. And why, why don't we call him Emmanuel? Emmanuel was a, was a reference of everything he represents and all that he is. He, he is God with us, but his name, you know, is Jesus. You know, somebody might call me stupid, but my name is Joe. All right, so, but Jesus, his name is, is uniquely given to him by his father. And by the way, as I said, this is the name of Jesus it was a pretty common name among the Jews. It'd be like Joe in our culture or David, you know, a name that seems to be common among a lot of people. A lot of people going by those names. Well, in, in, in the history of the Jewish people, this common name of Jesus was, was there. And sometimes translated in the Old Testament, Hosea. Sometimes translated uh, Joshua. But it means the same thing. It, it, it's, it's all together means Jehovah is a Savior or God. That One is Yahweh, the most holy name of God. The other is the word meaning salvation. So what you have here is this, this, these two words put together, which means God is our salvation. And if all things that Jesus is, and all things that He can be declared to be, He is our salvation. He is our hope. He, he's the answer for, for eternity. So the real meaning behind all this is this name of God and this name for salvation. And it literally means together that Jehovah is our salvation. There are three Old Testament characters that I want to look at this morning and show you a little bit of, uh, give you a little history about this name of Yeshua, as it would be pronounced in, in the Hebrew language. Sometimes in the English language, Hosea, sometimes Joshua, sometimes Jesus, but one Hebrew word, Yeshua. Where's this name, and what are the prototypes for, from, from history for this name? Well, let's look at, first of all, is, is the name of a high priest by the name of Joshua. He's, he's named in, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 3, and he is really a a, a type of Christ. In other words, he gives us a, a prophetic picture, when I say a type, a prophetic picture of who Jesus would be and, and what Jesus would do for us. And he's seen in this vision of Zechariah uh, and, and it, it, Yeshua, jo Joshua, this, this 
high priest at the time, he appears in the vision in the high court of Jehovah God. And it says there, as, it, as the vision goes in Zechariah, now Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus, was clothed with filthy garments, standing before the angel. And he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. And again he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with festal robes. Now here's this high priest in this vision. He's standing there. Zechariah sees the vision. He's the high priest of the people at the time, the son of Josedek. And he's clad not in these beautiful priestly garments. He's, he is in priestly garments, but they're covered and they're stained. And the Bible says literally they're filthy, all right? So he's clad in these filthy garments. And if you look at the whole of the vision... What is happening here is that he's under accusation by the devil. And he's hurling these accusations. And the devil can rightfully do this because anybody who stands there in, in the filthy garments representing sin, he, he stands there with these filthy garments representing the sin of the nation and the, the, the sin of the people of God. And because he is clad in these garments, he's the one who is there to to bear the filthy sins of the people, and there, clad in the garments, he must also bear the punishment for the guilt and the shame for the sins of the people. Now, this is a great illustration of Jesus, because Jesus is the high, ultimate high priest, according to the Word of God. And this is prophetically implies that he will stand one day, from this particular point in time in history, for and on behalf of all the people, and he will bear their iniquities, and he will bear their sins like filthy garments, and he will be the one who has to pay the price for the sins of the people. Now, this is the picture you see. Now, Isaiah gives a little insight into this as well. When he says, all we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Like Yeshua, like Joshua, the high priest, he stands there. Isaiah is speaking prophetically of Jesus who would come and that he would have upon him the iniquity of us all, that he would be the sin bearer. John spoke of the Lord Jesus, and remember he's the cousin of Jesus. When he sees him on the day of his baptism, as he comes through the crowd, John speaks of him and he sees that Jesus is there. Let me go past, uh, I got ahead of myself somewhere. You got John 129, if you'll go back to John 129 there. It's, it's under, uh, right after Isaiah. 53, 6. It says, The next day John saw Jesus coming unto him, and behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. What's John saying? John said he's going to bear the iniquities for us. He's going to be the sin bearer. He's going to be the one who deals with all our sins and carries our sins away. This is Yeshua. This is a, a, a picture of Jesus now in the Old Testament from Zechariah and from Isaiah. So he, he becomes now the sacrifice, not the people. They've sinned, but he takes their place in sin, and ultimately he's representative of Israel in this point. So he is the sacrifice, not the people. It's a sacrificial lamb and not a sacrificial man. So Hebrews 9 says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, that's his body, all right, not made with hands, that's to say not of this creation, not through the blood of goats, not through calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So the purpose is to show, here's the prophet. The prophet is also a, a, the picture of the high priest. And there he's not only the high priest, he's the sacrifice. He's not only offering up the sins of the people, he is the offering. Jesus Christ is so clearly seen in that particular place. He becomes a man. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin, that you and I might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hey, praise God. When he comes again, he'll be clad in the festal garments, as the scripture talks about in Zechariah. He'll be coming as king of kings and lord of lords. So the Bible says in, in Hebrews 3, 1, it says, Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. So Jesus, like the Joshua of the Old Testament, is a high priest. Now there's another character in the Old Testament, which is Hosea. And you might not know, but Hosea is the same rendition of the word Joshua, which is pronounced biblically. The biblical translation of that word is, it's, it's, I'm missing a screen here, go back one. Can you go back for me there, to back to Hosea? All right, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place this morning, well, what I got going here. Yeah, it's not given to me. Anyway, Jesus was the priest sacrifice. Hosea was a prophet redeemer. Now, catch this. Remember the story of Hosea? If you've ever read the book of Hosea, you see here's this prophet 
who's really the prophet, not just of preaching the, you know, the wrath of God, but he's also a prophet of grace. And Hosea had this, this uh, word from God that his wife, who was, who was rebellious, who ran off and lived in an adulterous relationship, who in fact ended up on a slave block, that Hosea was not only go back to, to receive his wife, he literally had to buy her as a slave off the auction block and then forgive her and receive her. Now, she is a picture of Israel in that regard. Yes, it was a real happening. He's a real man. She was a real person. And she, she comes as a redeemed person. So he's, this, he's, he's a prophet redeemer who comes, a prophet of grace, a prophet of salvation. It's the story of a great man who had a rebellious wife who does everything needed to bring his wife back into fellowship, finds her on the slave box, and becomes literally someone who buys someone off a slave block. It's called a redeemer. And he redeems her. So that's the story of Hosea. He is a biblical picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who is also a prophet on our part, but also the minister of grace, who buys us out of sin slavery, redeems us, and sets us free. The third type is, the, is, is Joshua from the Old Testament. Now this Joshua, not the high priest we mentioned earlier, he's the, the Joshua who's the general. He's the guy who takes Moses' place as they're going to go into the promised land. I don't know why it's not giving me the second and third clicks on these for some reason, but you can go back to, to Joshua there. He's the type of Christ who leads us in the spiritual battle. Here's the good thing about it. Like Hosea, Joshua, Jesus, Jesus buys us by the price of his own blood from slavery. You got that? He purchases us with the price of blood. So he's the redeemer. But now that we have been redeemed, Jesus, Joshua, this particular captain over the army of the Lord, he is the one who leads us in Jesus, our present Savior, is the one who leads us, like the children of Israel, into spiritual victory over the enemy that we face. We all know if you've been saved very long at all, we have, we have spiritual battles we face. Sometimes we're a little ignorant that they are spiritual battles. We, we want to blame other people or situations. We don't realize that we're in the middle of a war zone in our own life. But we have someone who leads us into battle, someone who arms us, someone who equips us, someone who gives us the necessary preparation for battle. And that is a picture of the Old Testament Joshua. Remember, he's standing over Jericho as he's getting ready to lead the people into the promised land. And there's this formidable city great walls around it, and Joshua is standing there looking at it, when all of a sudden, off to his side appears a man with a sword in his hand. Now, the story reads that Joshua confronts this man with the sword in his hand and asks him, are you for us or for the Lord? Are you for the enemy? Who are you for? And this particular character of the sword in his hand that Joshua is speaking to is Joshua, the Lord Jesus, all right, Yeshua. So Joshua is speaking to Joshua, okay, or Jesus, and Jesus, and this is what we call the pre-incarnate before he took on human form, became a man. He's still the Son of God in all his glory. He, you know, he, he just wasn't born in Bethlehem. He's always been. The Bible says he was in the beginning with God. All right? He's from eternity on. It, it, as long as God's been there, Jesus has been there. So we have Jesus who comes with his sword in his hand, and he tells Joshua, I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. Amen. He comes as the general not the captain. He comes as the commander of all the forces to lead the people into victory. Understand, today you and I have conflicts, all right? But we have a Joshua, a Yeshua, who leads us in this battle against principalities and powers. And one day will come in glory, and one day will lead us, the total people of God, along with the angelic army of God, back to the planet at the end of the tribulation. Let me read you this passage from Revelation. It says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he that judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. Why are they following him? Because he's the general, all right? The armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod iron, and treads up the winepress of fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture 
and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So you see this Old Testament leader in a simple prophetic picture of this great general, this King of Kings, this Lord of Lords who leads the great army of all time back to take victory and authority over the whole planet. So you see these three characters. You see a prophet, a priest, a commander, a leader, a king. This is Jesus, all represented in types and shadows. Yeah, there were particular lessons and experiences and circumstances at that particular time, but they all also represent to us a prophetic type and a prophetic picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Old Testament. Now let's move to the New Testament. The Gospels emphasize the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? And they deal ultimately with the humiliation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's not going to go back for me, would you? We'll forget the subpoints. You can take good notes, all right? But the Gospels, are, you know, represent Jesus. Remember, Jesus, again, is, a, is common. In fact, his name is so common that often he's referred to in the Gospels as Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus of Galilee, sometimes Jesus, the son of David. And they're added to clarify which Jesus are we talking about. Again, the biblical pronunciation, Yeshua. And it's by the name of Yeshua, or Jesus, that, that the Lord reveals himself to, to the Saul of Tarsus. He's referred to by this simple common name of just Jesus when he ascends into heaven and the angels say this same Jesus will also come in like manner. At Stephen's death, remember, as he's stoned by the, the Sanhedrin for, for believing the lordship of Jesus, as they're stoning him, the Bible says that Stephen saw Jesus, just Jesus, seated and I mean, right, standing up and receiving him into glory. So we see in the Gospels a, a tremendous emphasis on the humanity of Jesus. The epistles, on the other hand, they deal with Jesus as the, as, as the Lord of glory, as, in, in deity, as, as an exalted one, and, and the King of kings. So the epistles emphasize the Gospels' the humanity, even though they talk about kingship in, in Matthew, but it's humanity. The epistles, on the other hand, emphasize these names and these titles that are given like Christ you know, some people thought Jesus Christ, that that's his last name, all right? That's, that's, that's a title. That's something to give clarity to who Jesus is and which Jesus we're talking about. Sometimes referred to as Lord. Why? Because Jesus is a man, common name, common person, but he's also God. He's true God and he's true man. And inevitably, his name is connected, Jesus, his name is connected with divine titles like Lord or Christ. Christ is the, is the term for anointed one. It's a Greek word meaning Messiah. So he is Jesus Messiah, Jesus Christ, Jesus Lord. And these names are given to give it a little bit clarity to that he's not only God, but he's also man. He's all man, he's all God. And only God can do this. So whenever the name of Jesus appears just as Jesus alone, it is most, most of the time to emphasize that he's man. And when it's compounded with words like Lord and Christ, it's not only emphasizing humanity, but it emphasizes his deity. That song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, was written by, by, uh, by Charles Wesley. We sing it a lot of times at Christmas. And remember that Charles Wesley was not only a great preacher and a theologian, but he was also a hymn writer. And usually, you know, people that are good theologians write good songs. And sometimes people write stupid songs that don't necessarily have a lot of theological water in them because they don't study their Bible, all right? And I always love somebody puts out a song like that and say, well, the Lord led me to write this. And I think, oh, well, I think the Lord's a little more biblical than that. Anyway, <laughs> listen to the words of, of, of Wesley in that song when he writes Hark the Herald Angels Sing because he gives, the, he gives a real understanding to the humanity and the deity. Here's this verse which says, Christ, by highest heavens adored, Christ, the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hell incarnate deity, pleased as men with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. You have a clear, clear word, even from this hymn, that Jesus is God, yet he's man. He's man, yet he's God. In fact, it was Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, who said these words. As he wrote about the Lord Jesus, he said, it is Jesus, that great God and Savior, you see the deity of Christ. It was Peter who said, there's no other name under heaven among men whereby a man must be saved than the name of Jesus. You talk about the reason for the season. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. 
It all focuses around him. And if your Christmas is absent Jesus, all you have is a pagan holiday. But Christmas is all about the birth, the declaration that God is with men now, and he's come, and he's veiled in flesh, and he's there to do something for, the, for, the, for, for mankind and for humanity. So one of the titles we see of Jesus, where he's called the, the Christ, and th that he's the anointed one. There's some importance to this. To say he's Christ means that God has specifically put his hand upon him for a specific purpose. I'm going to try this one more time. Well, it's not going to work. Go back to the first one there. In Acts 2, 36, it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Well, there's two titles assigned to him here. He's made the, the Lord Jesus both Lord and Christ. So they mean two different things. He's Christ, but he's Lord. Christ is the word which has to do with his anointing that he is the one chosen by God. And there are eight witnesses in the word of God that we see who give us this answer that, uh, and, and this, this clear point that Jesus has been selected and anointed by God for a specific task, and that task is our redemption, our salvation. The first witness, well, it's not going to do it again. The first witness, just turn it off, put a background screen up. The first witness is Andrew. Andrew, remember, is the one who came running to his brother Peter to tell him that he'd seen the Christ. And Andrew said, you know, of Jesus in John 1, 14, we have found the Christ. In fact, we ought to be like Andrew. Once we've discovered Jesus, we ought to be telling others, hey, we've found the Christ. Simon, his brother, later comes up and, and, uh, and Jesus asked him, remember, they're, all, they're there together as a group, and Jesus said to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And it was Simon Peter who made that declaration of inspiration when he said, you know, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We ought to be the same as Peter. We ought to be confessing that Jesus is the Christ. He's the anointed one of God. Mark, in verse, the first gospel, very first verse of his gospel, says that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then there was the fourth witness in John's gospel. John says, you know, that he wrote his gospel for one reason and one reason only. He says there were many signs in John 20, verse 30, that D Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which aren't written in the book. But these are written that you might believe, carefully here it is, that you might believe, it's written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. What's he saying? John's saying he's the Christ. There was Mary and Martha. Remember, Martha's the oldest sister of Mary and Lazarus. Her testimony was this. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Then there was Peter in the, on the, on the, in the sermon on the day of Pentecost when he preached that Jesus was the Christ. There was Paul when he stood before the synagogue in Damascus and he insisted to the people there, Jesus is the Christ. And then there's the witness of the Lord Jesus himself. One, when he speaks to the woman at the well in John 4, verse 25, and, he, and the woman said to him, I know that the Christ, the Messiah, is coming. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Next verse, Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Jesus is saying, I am the Messiah. Matthew 26, Jesus kept silent. The high priest answered and said to him, I put you under the oath of the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Are you the anointed one? Verse 64 of Matthew 26 says, Jesus said to him, it is as you say. Yes, I am, in other words. And next time you see me, you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in clouds of heaven. Why? Why do we have these witnesses? Because they all declare that he is the Christ, the Son of God. He's the anointed one. In other words, he is God's means and method for getting men to God. So if I'm going to get to God, who, by the way, is on the throne of heaven. If I'm going to get to heaven, then I'm going to have to come by God's appointed and anointed means. In other words, I can't get to heaven through my works. I can't get to heaven through religion. I can't get to heaven through morality. I have to come through the one who is the appointed one, the Christ. And that is Jesus who said of himself, I am the way, I am the truth, I'm the light. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, how can he make that statement? Because he's the appointed anointed one. He's the one who God selected that. Now, one of the titles for Jesus is not just Christ. The other one is the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, or the Lord Jesus. And that's one of the most important titles in all scriptures when it comes to identifying Jesus Christ. Because it leads to 
an understanding that he is, he is the, the second person in the Godhead, that he is deity. He's, in, he's identified by the name Lord as incarnate God. In fact, I don't believe there's any more title that more exalts him than this word Lord, because it d does proclaim his deity. It does proclaim his equality with God. He's Lord. And over and over we see him as Lord. In fact, there's two, two Greek words in the New Testament for Lord. In the English Bible, we just have one word, Lord, Lord. But they come from these two Greek words. One of the words is the word kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S. And kurios is a word which we just translate the Bible as, as Lord. The other word is the word despots, like we, like we get to somebody's a despot or a dictator. That word is also used of Jesus. In fact, both terms are used to describe not only Jesus as Jehovah and Lord. In secular writings, both of these words were used in, in, in Greek secular writings, kurios and despots, to describe emperors who declared themselves like Caesar. They thought they were gods, you know. They were to be counted as absolute masters and, and rulers over mankind. Well, this title, Kyrios and Despots, they're both used of Jesus to describe him uh, as God and declare his authority. And they were given to people who had unrestricted power, you know, especially the word despot. That, that was used many times uh, in regard to someone who owned slaves. And if you were an owner of slaves at this particular time in history, then you had the right to determine uh, anything about their lives, what they do, what they ate, what they wore, where they were, when they were there. Uh, I mean, it, what, what they did with their bodies, their abilities, their energies. They had no control of their own lives. They were under the, the control of the despot. All right? Uh, they, were, they, were the, the, they were owned, lock, stock, and barrel by, by someone else. And the person who owned them was called the despot. Romans 6 talks about that in verse 16 through 20. He says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You're the one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, that's where you were slaves, you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, hallelujah, redeemed, you became slaves of righteousness. Isn't that interesting? He says you were slaves of sin, but now you're slaves of righteousness. You're servants of righteousness. In other words, the devil was our despot. When Jesus saved me, he became my despot. He became my owner. I and you, if you're a believer, we're on lock, stock, and barrel by Jesus Christ. He has total control of what will happen to us. And it, it, it basically insists upon absolute, unrestricted ownership. In fact, Paul calls himself a slave of God. And he goes on to say, we've been bought with a price. We've been purchased with the very precious blood of Jesus. So you have this word of, 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 of the word despot representing absolute ownership. The second word, and that's use of Jesus sometimes, the second word is kurios. This is used mostly in representing the Lord's name. Yes, he's despot in some cases, but uses, you know, the word kurios is used 150 times. As, and it's translated, you know, Jesus as Lord. There's another hundred times in scriptures when it says Lord Jesus. Those two words just put together like that. A, a great theologian by the name of Dwayne Spencer said, these two words, despots and curios, they're distinguished by saying this. If a man was a despot, he was a despot in regard to his slaves. If a man was curios, he was curios in regard to his wife and children. In other words, he's Lord, despot, over slaves. He's Lord Curios over wife and children. In fact, Abraham called, when she says she called Abraham, Sarah called Abraham Lord, uh, she referred to him as Lord. This is the word used, Curios. All right? So she said that, that Abraham is my Curios, which basically the implication if someone is Curios, if I, if, 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 like in regard to my wife and children, there's this implication of, of limitations, perhaps moral, mostly in Jesus' case, there's self imposed limitations. But nevertheless, the idea is a little different from the word despots. And Jesus is called despots, but he's also called curios. The idea of curios is someone who's exercising authority over someone else's life, but they're doing it with an absolute consideration of what is best for that person and what is right for that person and what is good for the person who they, they have this authority over. It's like when a man is called the head of the home. He's there for the good of his family. 
He's there for the support of his family. He's there to, as a provider. He's there as a protector. He's there to give a leadership which is righteous and whole and positive and good. That's curious leadership. That's Jesus. In fact, Jesus said, you know, you're, you are my slaves. But I don't call you my servants and slaves. I call you, man of the word, friends. In other words, it's slavery, but it is a happy slavery. A happy slavery versus the cruel bondage of sin. The Lord is there to provide for us, to protect us, to strengthen us, to fill us, to enable us. And so he reigns as Lord for the highest good, for the most noble causes. God's been good to me. I don't know about you, but even in my worst of times, God's been good to me. I mean, you should think about that for a moment in Christmas season. When many of you got to sit down and take moments and time and, and, and hours to kind of labor over what you want for Christmas, you're spoiled. Amen. Come on. <laughs> Amen. God's been good. And God has blessed us. And God has been this, this, this Lord who has been, he, he is despot. He's Lord over all creation. But he's also curious. The Lord Jesus who cares for us. The Lord Jesus who's there for us. The Lord Jesus who doesn't abandon us. The Lord who meets the needs of our heart and our life. I, I, you know, I love this quote from this, this first century pastor by the name of Polycarp. Many of you may be familiar with that name if you study Christian history at all. He's one of the, the pastors from the first century. He was one of John the Apostle, John the Beloved. He was one of his, his disciples who, 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 who taught him the Word of God and introduced him to Jesus. So Polycarp was, was uh, you know, as he grew in his faith, he became the Bishop of Smyrna. Remember the Church of Smyrna? It was in Asia Minor. And he was taken by the Romans. And they took him and they were doing everything they could to get him to deny Jesus as Lord and to confess Caesar as the king and as the Lord. In fact, the command came to Polycarp, historians tell us. The words were this to Polycarp as he was there, bound on a pile of wood, being ready to be burned at the stake. They said to him, worship Caesar as Lord or die. And as they stood there with their flames ready to ignite the fiery cords under him, here's what Polycarp said. For 86 years I have served Christ my Lord, and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Light your fires. I do not fear the fire which burns for a season and after a while is quenched. Come, do your will. Why are you delaying? In other words, I'm not about to change my mind. We can stand here all day long. Let's just get it over with. Because I'm not going to deny him. Remember huddled in the upper room after the crucifixion of our Lord. The disciples were there. Thomas had not been there when the message came from Mary that Jesus had risen, and Peter and John had run to the grave and come back with a message. He's risen indeed. Thomas, remember, is doubting. He's not quite sure what they're saying. But when Jesus comes into that room through closed doors, he just appears in the room, Thomas falls down before him, and he says to Jesus, My Lord, my God. That's the same cry that ought to come off every one of our hearts. I want you to know when Jesus Christ, the conquering king and general, comes in his glory to cast down his enemies at his appearance, the world is going to fall on bended knees. And he will come as king over all king, despot over all despots, lord over all lords, curious over all curious, lord of lords. Philippians puts it this way, Wherefore God hath highly exalted Jesus and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is Lord. And if you bear his name as a Christian, if you confess him to be your Lord and Savior, then certainly your life, your habits, your activities ought to reflect that belief. For you to say he's Lord and deny his lordship in your life is to say a lie. And if we're going to declare Jesus as our Lord, then certainly our actions will bear witness with our lips that he is truly 
is Lord. We respect Him. We honor Him. We obey Him. We seek to live a life that honors Him. We ought to be proud, unashamed to bear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now when we look at the prophecies of the Old Testament and look at the fulfillment of the New Testament, when that angel comes and says, you will call His name Jesus, it all certainly has great significance to us. And the world, the world will see that same Jesus born as a babe in Methem. They will see him as a man, but as God. The Bible says on that day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. If he's not your Lord, then you have not yet begun to live. If he's not your Lord, you've not yet begun to experience what even Christmas is about, much less what life is about. I praise the Lord that we can come at Christmas, celebrate this time and celebrate this season, but how much more it means when our hearts are right. Maybe yours isn't right today. Maybe you're kind of like Hosea's wife. Maybe you had this relationship, but now you've wandered away. But God, the Lord Jesus, is a redeeming, gracious prophet, high priest, and king who draws you back, who's paid the price of His blood to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you so that your garments are not stained with shame anymore. They're gloriously righteous and white before the Lord because He's washed every stain. Get your heart right with God. Let Christmas be a time where you truly understand what this is all about. Where God becomes a man, becomes a redeemer, becomes a savior, becomes a Lord. Give your heart to Christ if you don't know Him. If you do know Him, Get your life right with Him. And you know what that means. Praise God for the promise of 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and God is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Walk out of this place clean today. Would you stand with your heads bowed? As we come to this time in this service,